so, so gorgeous, isn't it? I mean, a road that goes on forever out here. It is, it, it's so beautiful. It's got little tiny roads that come off of it and everything. And um, right now, you can't actually go down any of the roads that come off of Red Road because it's no human entry for now so that the animals and such can breed and have their young and not have to worry about stuff like that. Unfortunately, um, I mean, looking to my right, you guys can't quite see it, but unfortunately there are people that do go off-roading out here still and probably more so since uh, we've all had to be uh, shut in with uh, only essential businesses open. And so it's caused a lot more of that, that to happen. So anyway, what we are on to, <clears throat> love that squeak. What we are on today is we are on the borrowers. And we are on chapter five. Hopefully you guys have ordered your book and it's on the way or it's getting ready to be on the way. Uh, because as you see, I mean, there is a lot, a lot of imagination that goes into this book. So let's go ahead here and start on chapter five. Arietti had not been asleep. She had been lying under her knitted coverlet, star, uh, staring up at the ceiling. It was an interesting ceiling. Pod had built Arietti's bedroom out of two cigar boxes. And on the ceiling, lovely painted ladies dressed in swirls of chiffon blew long trumpets against the background of blue sky. Below, there were feathery palm trees and small white houses set about a square. It was a glamorous scene, above all by candlelight. But tonight, Arietti had stared without seeing. The wood of a cigar box is thin, and Arietti, lying straight and still under the quilt, had heard the rise and fall of worried voices. She had heard her own name. She had heard homily exclaim, nuts and berries, that's what they eat. And she had heard, after a while, the heartfelt cry of, what shall we do? So when Homily appeared beside her bed, she wrapped herself obediently in her quilt and, patting her in her bare feet along the dusty passage, she joined her parents in the warmth of the kitchen. Crouched on her little stool, she sat clasping her knees, shivering a little, and looking from one face to another. Homily came beside her. Kneeling on the floor, she placed an arm around Arietti's skinny shoulders. Arietti, she said gravely, you know about upstairs? What about it? asked Arietti. You know there are two giants. Yes, said Arietti. Great Aunt Sophie and Miss Driver. That's right, said Homily and cramp full in the garden. She laid a roughened hand on Arietti's clasped ones. You know about Uncle Henry? Arietti thought a while. He went abroad, she said. Emigrated, corrected homily, to the other side of the world, with Aunt Lupi and all the children, to a badger set, a hole in a bank under a hawthorn hedge, now, why do you think he did this? Oh, said Arietti, her face alight, to be out of doors, to lie in the sun, to run in the grass, to swing on twigs like the birds do, to suck honey. Nonsense, Arietti, exclaimed Homily sharply. That's a nasty habit. And your Uncle Henry has rheum a rheumatic sort of man. He emigrated she went on stressing the word, because he was seen. Oh, said Arietti. He was seen 
on the 23rd of April, 1892, by Rosa Pickhatchet, on the drawing room mantelpiece, of all places, she added suddenly in a wondering aside. Oh, said Arietti. <clears throat> I have never heard nor no one has ever seen fit to tell why he went on the drawing room mantelpiece in the first place. There's nothing on it, your father assures me, which cannot be seen from the floor or by standing sideways on the handle of the bureau and steadying yourself on the key. That's what your father does, as he ever goes into the drawing room. They said it was a liver pill, put in Pod. How do you mean? asked Homily, startled. A liver pill for Loopy. Pod spoke wearily. Someone started a rumor, he went on, that there were liver pills on the drawing room mantelpiece. Oh, said Homily, and looked thoughtfully. I never heard that. All the same, she exclaimed. It was stupid and foolhardedly. There's a way down except by the bell pull, she dusted him, they say, with a feather duster. And he stood so still alongside a Cupid that she might never have noticed him if he hadn't sneezed. She was new, you see. She didn't know the ornaments. We heard her screeching right under the kitchen. And they could never get her to clean anything much after that wasn't chairs or tables, less of all the tiger skin rug. I don't know hardly, never bother with drawing room, said Pod. Everything's got its place like, and they see what goes. There might be a little something left on a table or down the side of a chair, but not without there's been company. And there never is no company, not for at least ten or twelve year. Sitting here in this chair, I can tell you by heart every blessed thing that's in that drawing room, working round from the cabinet by the window to the... There's a mint of things in that cabinet, interrupted Homily. Solid silver, some of them. Solid silver violin. They got their strings and all just right for our Arietti. What's the good, asked Pod, of things behind glass? Couldn't you break it? Asked Arietti. Just a corner, just a little tap, just a... Her voice faltered as she saw the shocked amazement on her father's face. Listen here, Arietti, began Homily angrily. And then she controlled herself and patted Arietti's clasped hands. She don't know much about borrowing, she exclaimed to Pod. You can't blame her. She turned again to Arietti. Borrowing's a skilled job, an art-like. Of all the families who've been in this house, there's only us left. And do you know why? Because your father, Arietti, is the best borrower that's been known in these parts since, well... Before your granddad's time. Even your Aunt Loopy admitted that much. When he was younger, I've seen your father walk the length of a laid dinner table after the gung was rung, taking a nut or sweet from every dish and down by the fold in the tablecloth as the first people came. In at the door. He'd do it just for fun. Wouldn't you, Pod? Pod smiled wanly. There wasn't no sense in it, he said. Maybe, said Homily, but you did it. Who else would dare? I were younger then, said Pod. He sighed and turned to Arietti. You don't break things, lass. That's not the way to do it. That's not borrowing. We were rich then, said Homily. Oh, we did have some lovely things. You were only a tot, Arietti, and wouldn't remember. We had a whole suit of walnut furniture out of Doll's house and a set of wine glasses in green glass. 
and a musical snuff box, and the cousins would come and we'd have parties. Do you remember, Pod? Not only the cousins, the harpsichords came. Everybody came except those over mantles from the morning room, and we'd dance and dance, and the young people would sit out by the grating. Three tunes that stuff box played Clementine, God Save the Queen, and Post Chalice Gallop. We were the envy of everybody, even the overmantles. Who are the overmantles? asked Arietti. Oh, you must have heard me talk of the overmantles, exclaimed Homily. That stuck-up lot who lived in the wall high up among the lathe and plaster behind the mantelpiece in the morning room. And a queer lot they were. The men smoked all the time because the tobacco jars were kept there. And they'd climb about and in and out the carvings over the mantel, sliding down pillars and showing off. The women were conceited lot too always admiring themselves in all those bits of overmantel looking glass. They never asked anyone up there, and I, for one, never wanted to go. I've no head for heights, and your father never liked the men. He's always lived steady, your father has, and not only the tobacco jars, but the whiskey decanters, too, were kept in the morning room, and they say those overmantel men would suck up the dregs in glasses through those quill pipe cleaners they kept there on the mantelpiece. I don't know whether it's true, but they do say that those overmantel men used to have a party every Tuesday after the bailiff had been to talk business in the morning room. Laid out they'd be dead drunk, or so the story goes, on the green plush tablecloth all among the tin boxes and the account books. Now, homily, Pod protested, who did not like gossip. I never see them. But you wouldn't put it past them, Pod. You said yourself when I married you not to call on the overmantles. They lived so high, said Pod. That's all. Well, they were a lazy lot. That much you can't deny. They never had no kind of home life kept themselves warm in winter by the heat of the morning room fire, and ate nothing but breakfast food. Breakfast, of course, was the only meal served in the morning room. What happened to them? asked Arietti. Well, when the master died and she took to her bed, there was no more use for the morning room, so the overmantles had to go. What else could they do? No food, no fire. It was a bitter cold room in winter. And the harpsichords? Asked Arietti. Homily looked thoughtful. Well, they were different. I'm not saying they were stuck up too, because they were stuck up. Your Aunt Lupi, who married your Uncle Hendry, was a harpsichord by marriage, and we all know the airs she gave herself. Now homily, began Pod. Well, she had no right to. She was only a rainpipe from the stables before she married Hopsicord. Didn't she marry Uncle Hendry? Asked Arietti. Yes, later. She was a widow with two children, and he was a widower with three. It's no good looking at me like that, Pod. You can't deny she took it out of poor Hendry. She thought it was a come down to marry a clock. Why? asked Arietti. Because we clocks live under the kitchen. That's why. Because we don't talk fancy grammar and eat anchovy toast. But to live under the kitchen doesn't say we aren't educated. The clocks are just as old a family as the harpsichord. You remember that, Arietti, and don't let anyone tell you different. Your grandfather could count and write down the numbers up to, what was it, Pod? Fifty-seven, said Pod. There, said Homily, fifty-seven. And your father can count, as you know, Arietti. He can count and write down the numbers on and on as far as it goes. How far does it go, Pod? Close on a thousand, said Pod. 
there, exclaimed Homily. And he knows the alphabet because he taught you, Arietti, didn't he? And he would have been able to read, wouldn't he, Pod? If he hadn't had to start borrowing so young. Your Uncle Henry and your father had to go out borrowing at 13. Your age, Arietti. Think of that. But I should like, began Arietti. So he didn't have your advantages, went on Homily breathlessly. And just because the harpsichord lived in the drawing room, they moved in there in 1837 to a hole in the wainscot just behind where the harpsichord used to stand. If there was one, which I doubt, and were really a family called Linen Press or some such name and changed it to harpsichord. What did they live on? Asked Arietti in, in the drawing room. Afternoon tea, said Homily. Nothing but afternoon tea. No wonder the children grew up peaky. Of course, in the old days, it was better. Muffins and crumpets and such. And good rich cake and jams and jellies. And there was one old harpsichord who could remember silly bub of an evening. But they had to do their borrowing in such a rush, poor things. On wet days, when the human beings sat all afternoon in the drawing room, the tea would be brought in and taken away again without a chance of the harp harpsichords getting near it. And on fine days, it might be taken out into the garden. Loopy has told me that sometimes there were days and days when they lived on crumbs and on water out of the flower vases. So you can't be too hard on them. Their only comfort poor things, was to show off a bit and wear evening dress and talk like ladies and gentlemen. Did you ever hear your Aunt Loopy talk? Yes. No. I, I can't remember. Oh, you sure have heard her say parquet. That's the stuff the drawing room floor is made of. Parquet. Parquet, she'd say. Oh, it was lovely. Come to think of it, your Aunt Loopy was the most stuck up of them all. Arietti's shivering, said Pod. We didn't get the little maid up to talk about Aunt Loopy. Nor we did, cried Homily, suddenly contrite. You should have stopped me, Pod. There, my lamb, tuck this quilt right round you, and I'll get you a nice drop of piping hot soup. And yet, said Pod, as homily fussing at the stove, ladled soup into a teacup. We did, in a way. Did what? asked homily. Get her here to talk about Aunt Loopy. Aunt Loopy, Uncle Hendry, and, he paused, Eglatina. Let her drink her soup first, said homily. There's no call for her to stop drinking, said Pod. See how it's kind of fun to listen how these guys are uh, kind of talking to themselves back and forth and how uh, uh, how their words are coming back and forth to them. And it, it, it's, to me, it, it's a lot of fun. It, it's fun seeing how this works and how everything around here is just that different. Anyway... I wanted to thank you guys so much for tuning in today. You all have a wonderful, wonderful and blessed day.